Good morning. Welcome to Oak Street Baptist Church this morning. I hope that you came ready to enthusiastically and joyfully praise the Lord this morning, whether you're here with us or online or listening on the radio. Let's stand together. And let's let the redeemed of the Lord say they're redeemed this morning. Just a prayer to pray, more than just a way to heaven. What does it mean to be His, to be formed in His likeness, know that we have a purpose? that the church would arise oh that we would see with Jesus eyes we would show the world heaven show what it means to be his to be formed in his likeness show them they have a purpose to be salt and light to be salt and light in the world in the world guys have a seat. Man, that was awesome. That was so great. Oh, this is what, a, what a wonderful way to start the service. Thank you guys for that. Welcome to Oak Street Baptist Church. My name is Stephen. I'm the student pastor here. It's a joy to see you today. And for those of us joining us on the radio and online, we want to say welcome to you as well. In your bulletins, we have a couple things. First off is a prayer request tab um, right here. If there is a need that you have in your family, um, that we can be joining you in prayer about, please 
write that down on that card. Drop it in one of the offering boxes on your way out of the service. We'd love to pray for you and for your family. If you're new here, if you have not been here, this is your first time, in the seat back in front of you, we have a welcome packet. It has some information about who we are as a church, the different things that we believe, and most importantly, there's a, a tear-off section in there as well. If you wouldn't mind filling that out and dropping it in one of the offering boxes, we would love to get in contact with you this week. Answer any questions that you may have about our church and see how we can get you plugged in. Um, wow. Super Summer is coming up. I'm so excited, guys. Super Summer is a wonderful, wonderful ministry that we're connected with for our students, and um, we're going to be going June 28th through July 2nd. If you are a parent of a student who's going to Super Summer, we are having a quick informational meeting about that right after Lifetime. It's going to be from noon to about noon 20 in the youth hall. And so we'll get you in and out quick. Um, and at the same time, our junior high, we're having a hangout today for them from 12 to 2 p.m. And so uh, they can just, you just drop them off over there. We'll kind of have them eating outside while we're doing that meeting. And then we'll spend some time together with them. Wednesday nights, uh, we have a lot of things going on here on Wednesday nights. And we would love for you and your family to be a part of that. Um, so please join us on Wednesday night. And this is important. We have an informational meeting. Um, again, if you are going to help out with VBS and you did not go to the informational meeting last week, please, please make it a priority to be there this Wednesday at 6 so that we can get you ready to go uh, for VBS. This Saturday, we are having a men's ministry day out at the lake. And um, there's going to be breakfast, lunch, and of course, competition. And so there's going to be lots of games and prizes. And so if you would like to, to be a part of that, you can talk to Mr. Willie Perkins. And I think there might be a sign up in the foyer as well for that. Coming up this next Sunday, oh, well, yes, we do have VBS Mystery Island. Um, if you have not signed your kids up, please do so. And if you haven't signed up to, to help out, please consider doing that. It takes an army to make this happen, but it's such an important ministry in the life of our church. Um, this next Sunday, we're going to be having Life 101 uh, right after the service here in the sanctuary. If you're interested in learning about membership here at Oak Street Baptist, this is the place for you to go. So next Sunday, you can just hang out right here in the sanctuary after the service is over, and PJ is going to lead that class uh, next Sunday. The um, family forum, we're having a family forum come up in two weeks from today. It's going to be at 5 p.m., and there's a few important things that we'll be talking about, some things building-wise uh, that we're doing, you know, obviously all the stuff going on with the education wing and the rebuilding process, um, but also we are going to be voting on um, new people coming in as elders and deacons, and so um, for elder, we're going to be uh, voting on Tim O'Malley coming in as an elder, and then for our deacons, Audie Walker, Justin Hearn, and Thomas Loftus. And so uh, this is a really important thing in the life of our church. So please uh, make it a priority to be here in two weeks uh, at 5 p.m. for this family forum that we have coming up. The Summer 6 Remix is coming up. This is going to start June 27th, and I'm really excited about this this year. If you haven't been a part of our church when we've done this before, this is a time um, to go to a new class just for six or seven weeks and to learn something new, to be around different people. Um, we have some information in the tear-off section in your bulletin. So one side's prayer requests, and the other side it has the six different classes. There's some more information on this insert, and on the other side we have our student calendar. And so that just has like a one-sentence preview of what we're doing. But we also, over the next few weeks, we're going to have the different teachers come up and talk about, just give you a one-minute one minute um, review of what the class is going to be like. That was directed at no one in particular. But, um, and so, in spirit of that, I'd like to invite PJ and Patty up uh, to tell us about their class. Hey, honey, are you about ready to go to church? You always are making us late for church. Don't they have a beautiful house? Why can't you buy me a house like that? It's because you don't make enough money. Your mother seems very interested in our family. She needs to learn how to keep her nose out of our business. 
I just saved $50 on a bedspread. I'm helping our family go broke by saving money. I heard this. I heard that. You know, a lot of times that's what happens in marriages or families. Uh, we, we say something and the other person says, you didn't say that or I heard this or anything. And uh, in Lifetime a couple years ago, we went through this book. I said this, you heard that. It's a, com it's a communication uh, tool that you can use in your family, your marriage, with friends at work or wherever. So we're offering that. That's going to start uh, June 27th, and we, we really, uh, two things, we have a limit uh, on our class to 20 people, and we're going to ask you to buy the workbook, it's $10, but the Patty Finfrock Scholarship Fund uh, will help you if, if you just can't <laughs> swing it, but we, we really think it's a good investment uh, in your family, in your marriage, in your life, thank you. Thank you. Hold the applause for <laughs> Thank you, PJ. Um, we also have another class that we're doing for marriages, and this is one that I'm leading, and it's called A Lasting Promise. And uh, this is a course that's been put together um, from Christian psychologists, and the goal of this, it's a seven-week course. Um, what we're going to do is we are going to look at kind of the biblical definition of marriage, and then we're going to use some biblically informed and psychologically informed tools uh, to help you in your marriage do two things. Uh, one is to increase happiness and satisfaction in your marriage. And number two is to reduce the risk of divorce. Um, it's a wonderful, wonderful uh, material, a packet that's been put together. Um, and one of the things that's important to know about this is that um, in the trials that they've done, um, there is statistically significant data that people who go through this course, it reduces the risk of divorce over time. Um, and so that's important for you to know. Uh, again, this is for people who are married. And um, it's not just for people whose marriages are on the rocks. If, you, if you're struggling in your marriage, I would love for you to be a part of this class. If your marriage is good and you want to make it better, I would love for you to be a part of this class as well. Um, again, it's something that has been beneficial in my marriage. And my goal is, is to help you, to give you tools um, and things that you can lean on uh, to, to, ha to have better results in conflict, um, to have more happiness and satisfaction, and again, reduce the risk of divorce in the future. And so that's a lasting promise. And just like PJ, uh, we do have some limited space, and we do have some workbooks as well that are also $10. And if you need help, I don't, I don't know, the Patty Friend for Rock Scholarship, you know, we can just throw that in there too. So you just, <laughs> you just holler at me or Patty, and uh, we'll, get you, we'll get you signed up for that. Uh, I, think it's, I think it's important to know that we, we believe in marriage, and we are for your marriages in this church. And I think that's why we've got two classes that are, that are geared toward this, because we want you to succeed. We don't want you to be stably miserable for the glory of God. Okay, that's not what we want. Um, we want you to, to be happy. And, and so these two classes are a great way to do that. So that's my minute. And um, thank you for being here today. Man, I, I, love, I love our church. I love the things that we're doing. And um, continue to pray for our team that's in Yucatan right now that are serving. I know they had the seminary graduations recently. Did we get everybody down there? Are they all there right now? Yes. Okay, good. So be praying for them. They're leading a women's conference. They're doing evangelism. A lot of stuff this week. Uh, hopefully you have their names from the tear out last week. But, but continue to pray for God to move um, in their midst. I'd like to invite um, Jimmy and Anna Moreno up to continue our service with the scripture and prayer. Good morning, church. Good morning. My name is Jimmy Moreno, and this is my lovely wife, Anna. We're going to be reading from Deuteronomy chapter 6. Would you, would you stand with us as we read God's word? This is an old text um, given to the people of Israel before they were fixing to enter in the promised land. And it's a wonderful, rich word. Good morning. Listen, Israel. The Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. These words that I am giving you today are to be in your heart. Repeat them to your children. 
Talk about them when you sit in your house and when you walk along the road, when you lie down and when you get up. Bind them as a sign on your hand and let them be a symbol on your forehead. Write them on the doorpost of your house and on your gates. Would you pray with me? Lord Jesus, we come before you remembering what you've done. You have done good things. You have come to rescue your your creation from destruction, and you have come to set our feet right. So, Lord, we, we repent for not sharing this good news to the generations coming up. We have a generation that is turning from you, that is wayward in who they are and, and who they think they should be. They are wayward in discernment. They are wayward in what is natural. And, Lord, we see from your word that that is a direct correlation to this. So, Lord Jesus, I pray that you would uh, grant us grace to repent, that you would open our eyes to see where we have been deficient in this, and, Lord, that you would give us gusto to be disciple makers, Lord, that we would tell our children and their children and their children, Lord, of the good news of Jesus, Lord, that we would go beyond our houses, Lord, that we would tell the nations um, of your good news, that we would tell the United States of the good news of Jesus, Lord, that we would be salt and light, and Lord, that you would help us to be people that act as the redeemed. And I pray, Father, for our, our team in Yucatan. God, I pray, God, that you would give them uh, extraordinary strength and zeal and uh, delight in hard work, and Father, that you would help them to be bright and clear, and Lord, that you would give them supernatural Uh, ability to speak your good news into the nations. Uh, Lord, we love you, and Lord, we just look forward to seeing the big things you do here, Lord, and that you would enable us to change the world for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. While you're standing, why don't you take just a minute, uh, and by a minute, I mean 30 seconds, to shake somebody's hand there close to you. Don't move too far. I'm talking to you, PJ. Don't move too far. We're about to worship.
As we sing this next song, I want to open up the altar. If you have a need this morning that you'd like to bring before the Lord, the altar at Oak Street is always open. I'm trying to extend a special invitation right now. So word of God speak Would you pour out like rain Washing my eyes to see Your majesty To be still and know That you're in this place Please let me stay and rest In your holiness Word of God
Father, thank you for your word that says even when we don't know what to pray or how to pray, that your spirit intercedes with groanings that are deeper than words. You know our hearts, Lord. You know our needs. You know the struggles that we walked in here with. You know the great joys of our life and the sadnesses. Lord, uh, our life is an open book before you. Father, in this place and in this time, do your great work. Do your work, Lord, of power. Do your work of, of molding and shaping and forming and fashioning us into the very image of Christ. Lord, we pray for a mighty moving of your Spirit, not just among us, but in us, Lord Jesus. Work in us. Let us experience you fully this morning and express you fully this week to a world that is dark, a world that is broken, a world that is needy. Lord, strengthen us, strengthen our marriages, and strengthen our families. We ask in Christ's name, amen. Amen. Uh, be seated. And uh, do a couple, did a couple of you guys get asked to put up some chairs? Oh, okay, there you go. Oh, once you just set up a little semicircle right over here, would you do that for me, Hav? Appreciate it. There you go. I knew I was in trouble when uh, I looked out, uh, the guy that had asked to do this, and he was out there on the street doing security. I said, something's disconnected here, so, so here we go. This fine oil machine will continue to roll. Let's look in Acts chapter 17. Uh, we'll look at verses 10 through 12. And I, I really try to, to, to be careful and not overstate things or every time come and say, oh, this is, boy, this, but I, I have this thing in my heart uh, this morning and have all week that this, this might be the most important message for your family, for the generations that are to come. So I would, I would ask parents and grandparents to listen very closely and, and just ask God, God, how do you want me to apply this message to our life? Now, last Sunday night, we had our night of worship, and Chris and the band, they were so courageous. They said, just shout out a song or a hymn or a praise song, and we'll play it and sing it, kind of like, you know, your request. And it was great. We had a wonderful time for about an hour and a half. We just, people shouting out, you know, song titles and page numbers out of the old hymnal. And, and uh, we had a great time. And I thought, hey, I think I'll try that. I'll just give that a try. So I told some people, I said, there's going to be a jar in the office. And give me your requests. Whatever you want, just put them in the jar. Here's the first one I pulled out. 15-minute sermons. And I just want to know whoever put that in. I've got feelings too, you know. I can be hurt. Just for that, we're going to see how long we can go this morning. Our series is hashtag great family. And there are three people that want your family to be great. Jesus, you, and me. I'm pulling for you. I'm rooting for you. I'm praying for you. I'm, I'm doing everything I can think of to help your family experience the true greatness that God has for you. And today's message, I'm, I really am. I'm just so excited. There's just a, a stirring in me. There's an excitement and an uh, anticipation in me because today we're going to talk about a great family tradition. And we'll get there in just a few moments, but uh, I want to kind of set the stage and give you the context of the, the passage. Now, if you look at the Cliff's Notes of the book of Acts, they go something like this. The, Acts chapter 1 is the commissioning by Jesus. 
Go into all the world, be my disciples. He says, he says, you'll receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. And you will be my witnesses. And uh, then he ascends into heaven. In Acts chapter 2, sure enough, true to Jesus' word, the power of God through the Holy Spirit falls on the church. 3,000 people saved in one day. And then Acts chapter 3 through 6, the church grows. And it doesn't just grow a little here and a little there. The church explodes in growth. But they all kind of hover and stay together. And so in Acts chapter 7 and 8, we see that the church is persecuted. Stephen is stoned to death and, and the church is scattered. And then in Acts chapter, uh, we move along, Acts chapter 9, Saul is converted. He comes to know Christ, uh, becomes a great missionary. Acts 10 through 12 Peter takes the lead. We see the Apostle Peter stepping up and, and uh, the Gentile uh, Pentecost. And then Acts 13 and 14, the first missionary journey. The mission church in Antioch appoints and, and sends out two missionaries, Silas and Paul. Acts chapter 15, they come back and the Jerusalem council, they meet, they talk, say, you know, we really need some guidelines we need some, some loose boundaries on this Christianity. So they set some wise boundaries. Acts chapter 16 through 18 is the second missionary journey. Now it's Paul and Silas going on mission. Acts 19 through 21 is the third missionary journey. Uh, Paul and then this mysterious we that, uh, that Acts talks about. We're not sure exactly who all we're talking about here, but they go on mission. Acts 22 through 26, I entitled that Paul's trials. These are literal trials. They're literally, he's literally tried before the Sanhedrin, then uh, Felix, not the cat, uh, and Festus, not Hagen, and uh, then finally Agrippa, King Agrippa, and he goes through, through these four trials, and he's sent to Rome. In Acts 27 and 28, Paul goes to Rome where where he is to be uh, tried or listened to before the emperor of Rome. Now, that's a, that's a big overview. What I want to do then is, is, is close it down a little bit and show you uh, kind of what happens. It's what I call Paul's MO or modus operandi. This is, this is pretty much, not every time, but a lot of times, this is what happens on these missionary journeys. Paul will go into a city, and he'll find a group of people, sometimes in the synagogue, sometimes in the marketplace, but Paul will find a group of people, and he'll share the gospel. He'll preach, or he'll share and dialogue, and people come to Christ, and he will start a church. Well, some other people will get all riled up and fussy and, and, and you know threaten Paul or, or try to kill him, and so he'll go to the, the next city. Isn't that kind of interesting how God uses even opposition, even problems to get us where he wants us to go? Paul might have just camped out in one place, but this opposition kind of stirred things up, and he would go to the next city and the next city and the next city. Okay, let's get back to this idea of family traditions. What is a, what is a tradition? Is it good? Is it bad? Well, here's the definition. A tradition is the transmission of actions or beliefs from one generation to the next. You heard about the couple that got married in the first big dinner that the, the wife cooked. She took the ham and she cut off both ends of it and then put it on the pan and put it in the oven. He said, honey, why did you, why did you do that? She says, oh, that's the way my mother did it. Well, the next time he saw his mother-in-law, he said, uh, hey, why do you all cut off the ends of the ham before you stick it in the oven? She says, well, uh, that's because that's the way my mother did it. Well, he goes to grandma now, and he's really going, he said, Granny, what, what's going on? Why do you all cut off both ends of the ham before you cook it? And she said, oh, well, when grandpa and I were first married, my oven was too small to fit the ham, and so I cut off both ends. That's how family traditions are started. And maybe you have some things that you do as a family and you go, well, I got them from my parents and they got them from their parents. That's called a tradition. Now, I want to give you the Captain Obvious duh moment right here. Let's get that out of the way. Great families have great traditions. And so the question is, what are, what are the great traditions of your family? 
What are you doing as a family to transmit or transfer or transcend the generations to come? I mean, something that's meaningful, something that's special, something that's valuable, and something that's helpful to your family. You don't have to go to Telluride every year to go skiing. I'm not talking about every year you have to take the family to Hawaii or the French Riviera so you can experience something together. This can be something in everyday life that literally is life-giving and life-changing to your family. And so let's read the scripture, Acts chapter 17, verses 10 through 12. It says, as soon as it was night, the believers, these are the believers in Thessalonia, sent Paul and Silas away to Berea. On arriving there, he went to the Jewish synagogue. Now the Berean Jews were of more noble character than those in Thessalonica, for they received the message with great eagerness and examined the scriptures every day to see if what Paul was saying was true. Get this, as a result, many of them believed, as did also a number of prominent Greek women and many Greek men. And so I want to look at our, uh, this concept, this idea of a family devotion time. And just three simple truths about that. The first truth is, is it's a noble tradition. The scripture says, now the Bereans were more of more noble character than the Thessalonians. Now, this tradition, the family devotional time, is a time where your family gathers around the word of God, examines a truth from that, and, and learns together. I, as I look back on, on family life, and you know, we all look at things we think we did okay or well or things we didn't do so well as I look back over my family's history this if not the most important thing if not the best family tradition that we had this is certainly among the top three in fact I contacted my three adult children this week and I said honestly tell me what you think of our you know the the concept and the, and the idea and, and what we did as a family concerning family devotions and I'll share that at the end of the service just two things here very quickly number one it involves your family's faith there's nothing more important to me than faith in Christ and my family and when we have a family devotion I'm bringing together the two most important things in my life this says our faith is not just a one day a week experience. This is not something we just get in the car and go and then we come home and we go back to regular life. What we're saying is this is the heart. This is the soul of our family. It's notable because it puts God as the priority. It puts God and his word and his truths in the very center of our family. It's, it's, it's Jesus is Lord of this family, and we're going to remind ourselves of that. I have a, fam, or a tradition that I do before I do weddings, uh, the night of the rehearsal, when it's over. And I know people are scattered, and I know people are thinking about you know, all these things in the wedding and trying to get all the moving parts to come together as once and uh, to come together for the, for the wedding. And so I'm... One of the things I do, and I think I've done it at every wedding I've been a part of, is I gather the family together and the wedding party together. And I say, I want you to think about something with me for a few moments. And I recenter on the fact that this is, this is not about people. This is not about formals and tuxedos and venues and things like this. This is about Jesus Christ being the honored guest. And him being glorified and him turning something ordinary into something that's extraordinary. It's, it's a tradition. I remember as our little family, we would gather for our family devotions. 
And every day when we says, hey, is there somebody we want to pray for? One of the children would say, Papa, my father-in-law was, a, was an old Navy sea dog. He was a gambling, fighting, drinking man. Probably one of the hardest men I've ever known. And uh, I remember one time trying to share the gospel with him. And I, I came in at him and, and the, I just thought, man, this is a way to approach him. And I came to him to share the gospel. And he stuck his hand up like this in front of my face. And he said, stop it. I don't want to hear it. And in our family devotions, we would pray for Papa and pray for Papa. After 15 years, one Sunday, we were sitting down for Sunday dinner and the phone rang. And my wife started just, you know, just screaming and yelling just with joy. And Papa had called to say that he went to a little Baptist church that Sunday and he gave his life to Jesus Christ. This is the part of a family tradition. It involves faith, but secondly, it involves friendship. I mean, we're literally talking about a family circle with God and the Word of God at the center of that circle. But a family looking at each other, a family engaging each other, a family connecting with one another. Cell phones off, television off, headphones off, computer off. This is, this is our family. We are a unit. We have a special, unique, God-given relationship and responsibility to each other. Wars are not won by armies. They're won by squadrons and platoons and companies who fight for each other. And that's the idea we have in our family devotion. Hey, we are, we are one as a family. Not only is it a noble tradition, it's a necessary tradition. They were more noble than the Thessalonians, for they received the message with great eagerness and examined the Scripture every day to see if what Paul was saying was true. Now, Paul had spent three weeks in Thessalonica. Uh, it looks like they received what he had to say. When he went there and preached, they, you know, they listened, and some of them came to Christ. But then the opposition that we talked about early rose up, a mob rose up, and, and so here, here's Paul at night. They sneak him out of Thessalonica, and he goes west about 40 miles to this city of Berea. And they are more noble than the Thessalonians because they, they weren't spoon-fed. It wasn't like the Apostle Paul just gave everybody a little dose, and they just took it and didn't do anything with it. In fact, the scripture says they looked, they studied, they examined, they searched the word of God to make sure of the truth. Now think about this. This was back in a day when news just trickled in. When a visitor from out of town came and shared something that the, that the town didn't know. Or maybe it was a horse, a rider on a horse that came and brought news. Maybe it was a carrier pigeon. But what I'm saying is this, back then, you know, the new, news and information just kind of trickled in. And yet they said, we need to see if what this man is saying is true or not. Think about the day we live in. Man, in a microsecond, at the speed of light, information is, is transmitted. All this information from the world, all these things that the world says it just floods and, 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 and comes into our home and into our family. And if we just let it come in and, and we're just barraged by all this information, all these half-truths, all these non-truths that the world is giving us, where are we going to wind up as a family if we don't do something about that? If we don't challenge that, if we don't have the truth of God's word in front of us, we're just going to be a family that's tossed to and fro like by every wind of the sea. Family devotions expose our heads to the truth. You see, the battlefield really is the mind. Proverbs 23, 7, as a man thinks in his heart, so is he. 
the lies and the garbage and the perversions and the twistedness of this sin-filled, God-hating, Christ-crucifying world. They're just coming at us. And they come nonstop. And now they come around the clock. On our phones and on our computers and on our television screens. A family devotion is our opportunity to present the truth. Thy word is truth. Sanctify them in the truth. Jesus prayed. Not a time to preach at your family. A time to share with your family. What are we sharing? We're sharing the truth from God's word. And a family devotion also exposes our hearts to the truth. You see, the ultimate goal, the aim, the desire of the enemy is to capture your children's hearts. That's what he wants. That's the spoils of war. That's the prize. That's what he's after. Doesn't care how much money they make. Doesn't care what their profession is. Doesn't care, but his, their heart is his target. And he is zeroing in on the targets of our children's hearts. Proverbs 4.23, guard your heart, watch your heart with all diligence, for out of it come the, comes the wellspring of life. Years ago, we went to the, to the head of the Nile, the, the, probably the most famous, the longest river in the world, begins as this wellspring in uh, mid-southern Africa. And it just, right there, it comes out and it becomes the Nile. And that's what our heart is. It's the wellspring of life. It's where our life is built around. And I promise you, the devil is fighting for the hearts of your children and grandchildren. Are we going to fight for their hearts as well? Or are we just going to say, well, you know, it's just really hard. Oh, you know, our family, we're just so busy. I just don't think we can really make this thing work. Are we going to fight? Years ago, when all this started churning and brewing in my heart, God gave me a verse out of Hebrews, Hebrews 1.9. It said, and because they love righteousness and hate wickedness, God, even our God, will raise them up above their companions and anoint them with the oil of gladness. And I thought that's what I want for my family. That's what I want God to do. How are we going to do that? What, what process are we going to go to where, where our children will love righteousness and hate wickedness? And our answer was a family devotion. And then thirdly and finally, it's a notable tradition. Look at this. As a result, many of them believed, as did a number of prominent Greek women and many Greek men. Berea is in the heart of pagan country. I mean, if you want to get out a, an ancient map and look at it, I'll tell you, you'll find Berea. It's right in the heart of this, this pagan Greek culture. And these people grew up and, and, and all they heard about was Zeus and Apollo and Sidon and, and Artemis and, and uh, Athena. They lived and died hearing that, thinking that that mythology was true. Thinking they were all these gods and they did this and they did that and all these fables and, and, and far out stories spun together. And this is what they believed and this is how they lived. As people, as families. Until Paul came with the truth. And Paul said, I want to share a message with you. I want to share the truth with you. And Paul started sharing the truth. What Jimmy prayed in his prayer is exactly right. The most recent Barna study says 6% of Americans have, have a Christian worldview. Listen, that's... That's almost microscopic in our culture. 43% of millennials say now they don't believe in God. They don't want to know God. They don't care anything about God. I mean, that's a long way from where we were a generation or two ago. 
for the first time in American history, now less than half of our people attend church. And that's any kind of church at any time at all. You're in the major- minority if you go to church once a year somewhere. These are desperate times. Our culture is being swept by the millions into hell. And I can't control everything that goes on in the world, but there is some influence and impact and imprint that I can make on my family. Paul shares the the message of truth. And these pagans, these lost, respond. Are we doing are we doing anything besides coming to church? One hour is not enough. One midweek service for your your student is not enough. Not in this culture, not in this day, not in this age if ever. It's just not enough. The blessings of salvation will be, first of all, personal. Nothing more personal to us than our family, our life's mate, our children, and our children's children. That's, it just doesn't get any more personal. It doesn't get any more precious than that. If, if I can't do anything else, at least I can do this for my family. L.R. Scarborough was the second president of Southwestern Seminary, the where I attended. This was back in the day. He was a giant of a man, towering over others. He had a heart for evangelism. B.H. Carroll, the first president, actually named it the Chair of Fire. The L.R. Scarborough Chair of Fire of Evangelism. And after B.H. Carroll passed away, L.R. Scarborough became president. Although he was president of a seminary and wrote 14 books on evangelism, he went, at, he went out and preached over 500 times every year as president, speaking to people about coming to Christ and knowing Christ. But Scarborough had a wayward son, and his son got in a gunfight and was killed in, a, in the street in uh, North Fort Worth. And they said after that time, you could see Dr. L.R. Scarborough wandering around the seminary campus. And he would quote a verse out of Song of Solomon. Other vineyards I have tended, but my vineyard I have neglected. The blessings of salvation will be personal, but they'll also be public. Many believed. A number of prominent Greek women. Many Greek men, the gospel not only goes deep, the gospel goes wide. If you led one person to faith in Christ and disciple them for a year, and then the next year you each led one person to faith in Christ, disciple them, and then four of you won one person to faith in Christ and disciple them for a year, in 20 years a million people would have come to Christ. A million people influenced. Think of, think of the influence your family can have. Your nuclear family connected to the vine. My former mentor, Tom Elliff, I was talking to him one day. He said, uh, the other day was, was quite a day. I said, how's that? He said, four of my grandchildren called and said, uh, Grandpa, we led somebody to Christ today. We need to disciple them. You've probably heard of Jonathan Edwards, the great preacher of the First Great Awakening. He had 11 children, and every night he would gather his family and do a family devotion, and then he would pray a blessing over each one of his children. 150 years later, a historian said, I want what happened to Jonathan Edwards' family, and here's, here's part of the results of that. Out of this group who had started as this original 11 plus mother and father, 100 had become pastors, 60 had become doctors, 75 had become military officers, 13 had become college presidents, 3 had become senators, 3 governors, and 3 mayors, and 1 vice president. 
what started as a family devotion, what started as a family devoted to Christ, made an impact on thousands, perhaps millions of lives. What I'm thinking, some of you are thinking right now is, yeah, that's, the, that's easy for you. I mean, you're a pastor. I mean, you kind of are around this all the time, and this kind of easy and natural for you. Well, well, what about me? I'm, I'm not sure how to do this, and it sounds pretty complicated, and I've never been to seminary, and I don't have a theological degree, so, so what, you know, how, how does this work for me? Well, I want to show you this morning. I want to introduce you to a family. It's the Fern family. Okay, here is the Fern family. The Finfrocks and the Hearns came together and became the Ferns. And so I'm going to invite the, uh, the Fern family to come up here. I'm Joe Fern, and this is Patty Fern. And here comes Hayden Fern and Maddie Fern and Wyatt Fern. Morning, family. Come on in. Y'all sit down. How are you doing? Everybody okay? Yeah, get a good night's sleep? Okay, okay, hey, hey, hey. wait, okay, okay, y'all put up your, put up your toys, go put them up, we don't, you know, we're not going to be messing with our toys this morning, so let's, let's put them up, okay? I think that means we need to put up our cell phones too, okay, we'll put up our phones, okay, we're putting up our phones. Okay, well, let's, let's just start off our family devotion. I'll just uh, uh, ask you a question. Don't anybody look. What time is it? It's summertime. Oh, man, you got me. That's right. It's summertime. School's out, and things are kind of changing this summer. And so I think we'll just go around the circle, and everybody just say uh, what they'd like to do this summer. What's, what, you know, what's one thing that you'd like to do this summer? Maddie? Go swimming, yeah. As my grandpa used to say, go swimming with the women. Uh, that's a family joke there. That's a fern family joke that we're going to, okay. Hey, Hayden, what about you? Um, I want to go to the pool. Okay. Just go to the pool, but not necessarily swim. Aha, uh -huh, okay, okay. Sounds like you've been talking to your sister. How about you, Wyatt? What would you like to do this summer? Go to the beach. Okay, wow. Okay, so sounds like the kids really, uh, they want to be around family. some water. Yeah. Yeah. The Finn frocks and the, okay. Yeah. Uh, honey, what, what would you like to do? I think I'd like to go to Pennsylvania and see our extended family. Wow. family. A, a road trip for the family. I think that sounds awesome. And I think one day this summer, I'd like, to, I'd like to take our family to the worst baseball team in major leagues right now. Can anybody guess who that is? The Texas Rangers. Maybe we can just do that as a family outing and, and uh, go to that. Well, that's, that's great. Well, I wanted to just talk a little bit about time because summertime and I want to do something like this I heard a, a story years ago about there was a little boy and he took a clock and he threw it out the window you know why he wanted to watch time fly <laughs> and so and so here's what I want to do this is my I don't want you to throw it but I just want I want you to just look at it and pass it and just notice time doesn't stop it never stops. You see the second hand on my watch, it just keeps going and going. Just a little reminder that we only have a certain amount of time. And I thought I'd ask a couple of our family to read a scripture this morning that talks about that. And so, honey, if you'll read uh, Ecclesiastes 3, verse 1. And Hayden, would you, would you uh, look up, uh, okay, you got it, Ephesians chapter 5, isn't that right? Verses 15 and 16. Okay. So anyway, there you go. Pass. Look at the watch. Pass around. And okay. Isn't that amazing? Okay. Hun, go ahead and read that. Ecclesiastes 3 1. There is a time for everything and a season for every 
activity under heaven. Yeah. Do you hear what the you hear what the Bible says? There's a time for there's a time for everything. God has made a way for us to have a, a time for every activity. It's God who's given us the time to do it. We just have to be willing to do what God wants us to do. That's a pretty simple thing, isn't it? God gives us the time and then he get okay, go ahead, Hayden. Pay careful attention then to how you live, not as unwise people, but as wise, making the most of time because the days are evil. Okay. What do y'all think about that verse? Anybody have any thoughts about what that might mean? Oh. <laughs> well, um, maybe it's talking about when Satan's going to come back and take his people. Yeah, that could be so. That's a thought to think about. Okay, anybody else? You know, I, I read those verses, I thought, I thought, man, we better be on our guard. You know, because our family does have an enemy. The Bible says the devil wants to destroy our family, hurt our family, really wants to divide our family. He wants to kind of set us against each other instead of us being a loving, close family. So thank you for reading those verses. And, and I kind of want to close our family devotion by, by asking y'all this. Instead of thinking, what do I want to do this summer? Think of something that we could do together as a family to be a blessing to other people. Can anybody think of something maybe we could do this summer that would, that would be a, a blessing? Okay, Maddie? Cook a meal for somebody that's sick. Yeah, you and mom could cook a meal. Could sample it, see, make sure it's good and before we take it over there. Okay, take a meal to a family. Great, Hayden. Um, well, maybe taking out all the trash. Okay. Yeah, maybe we ought to start with our family first and <laughs> make sure we're doing that as a family, and then yeah, yeah, help help our neighbors take out their trash. That's good. Why? Can you think anything? Mow their yard. Man, that would be a blessing, wouldn't it? We got some neighbors that have some pretty good sized yards and, and we could help them out. That's great. Honey? How about if we visit, visited the elderly or some folks that can't get out and just bring a little sunshine? Yeah. You know, some people don't have a family like we do. They live yeah. by themselves and I'm sure they get pretty lonely so we could visit them. I was, I was even thinking going to our neighbors and maybe we can take them a little gospel track with a little cake that your mom and, and Maddie make and we'll just be a witness in our neighborhood for Christ. How about that? Great, great. Well, listen, it's time to go swimming, right? Yeah. Time to hit the lake, hit the, hit the swimming pool. And uh, let's, let's do this. Let's, let's just pray for each other, okay? Why don't we just pray for one, one member of our family that you'd like to pray for? Can we do that? Everybody okay with that? Okay, good. We'll just pray like a one-sentence prayer. Okay, you want to start? Yeah. Father God, thank you for this time this morning with our family. So thankful for each other. I want to especially pray for Wyatt. I, I know that he, he gets in trouble from time to time, but I saw him help a young lady this week, and I just want to say thank you for touching his heart and, and pray that he always always continues to pursue you and your will Lord thank you I thank you for Maddie and her kind gentle spirit how how she has such a, a tender heart for you and other people okay anybody else want to pray okay okay um, dear Lord um, thank you for my family because um, they're such a blessing to me and um, I really love them, and I thank you for everything that you have done for us, and um, I want to pray that um, n none of us get sick again. Amen. Amen. Father, thank you for our family. Please keep us tied in and keep us, keep us close to your word and keep us close to each other. Make us a blessing, Father to this world that needs to know you. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Thanks, kids. You did great. Let's go swimming.
one of the things that that uh, my kids said was, "Dad, you got to tell people." Sometimes kids don't want to do devotion. <laughs> sometimes you know they're in a foul mood, or sometimes they're sleepy, or and that under I understand that. Listen, there were so many times over the years that I get I just get so frustrated and. And it's like I was the only one that cared about doing this, and 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 everybody else was just, you know, it was like it was like taking bad tasting medicine, but but we stayed the course, and I'm thankful that we did. So let me just uh, three three little things here. Number one, keep it short. I know people go, okay, we're going to have a devotion. We're going to get up at five o'clock every morning, and you know, an hour, an hour and a half of studying God's word, and that doesn't last very long. The second thing is. Is keep it regular. Uh, it's called habit. And that means in life it's easier to do something daily than it is once a month. It's easier to do something regularly than it is to be sporadic. And then the third thing is, is keep it interesting to your children. Okay, it's not the time to talk about sacerdotalism in Western Europe. Okay, it's it's time to talk about the big fish story and Jonah or things like that. And so coming full circle, uh, you know, really, this just happened. My daughter called and we were just talking and I said, hey, I'm going to be preaching on on our family devotion. Honestly, tell me what you think. And she she said some things and I thought, well, I'm going to ask the other two uh, grown kids. And so I asked them, I said, please be honest and tell me what how you felt about us doing family devotion. So let me, uh, let's go ahead and put that up. I th and these are just, I said, give me one sentence. And they each wrote several paragraphs. They, they really did. But so I tried to, I tried to uh, condense it down. This is from my daughter. Uh, she's 40 years old, has two small children. She said it, the family devotional time came in stages. When I was little, I didn't like it. As I grew up, I began to appreciate it. I saw it as your spiritual covering over our family. It was the display of how much you cared for us, not just our hearts and minds, but our souls. The family devotion time was foundational. It was truth every day, especially when we were too little to read the Bible ourselves. Okay, the next one is uh, Abram. Abram is 38, just recently married. He said, as a kid, I hated family devotion, dot, dot, dot. That means he goes into some detail about how much he hated family devotion. I wanted to do anything but be a part of it. As a grown man, I look back at those times and am thankful to have a dad who made me do them. By the way, I will be having those stupid devotions with my kids because of how much they changed my life. And then Pete, who's also 38 years old and a father of three, he says, I've been thinking about this the last few weeks. They were pretty challenging when I was a kid. However, as an adult, I'm beyond thankful. The Lord used that time, Bible study, prayer, etc., to deeply form who I am today. Without it, I don't think I'd be who I am. I love God, His Word, prayer, and trust Him for big things. I think what I would attribute it to you sowing those seeds when we were young. And this is like tithing. You can't just say, oh, I'll just tithe, and everything else, the other 90% just goes like gangbusters. It's, it doesn't work that way. This is a, a piece, but it's an important piece. And I honestly feel like it's a piece that's neglected by many of our families. And I don't want anyone here my age or something like that beating yourself oh we didn't we didn't do it uh i didn't do it oh i should have and would have I'm, we're not going to go there we can't do a thing about yesterday or the day before but we can do something starting now and the way our family did it we just said hey during the school year right before we you know we'll like at 7 30 from 7 30 to, to 7 40 we'll have this time monday through friday take the weekends off and uh even when we'd go on, on vacations, we'd say, okay, let's, let's do a little short devotion every day before we start. And it really did. It, you could just feel it uh, 
fill times, not every day. Some days, well, you know, you're just grinding it out. And, hey, quit fighting and listen and pay attention. And, and okay, uh, other times you could just feel God's Spirit just putting a, a hook a little deeper in your child's heart. Or you could feel God put a hook a l- little deeper in your heart. Or you could say, I really believe that seed was planted today. And so, again, without any kind of you should do this and you ought to do that and how come you didn't and when are you going to start, I really would like to ask you as fathers and mothers, I would like to ask you to consider doing this. Uh, The Internet's got family devotions. You can go to Mardell's and buy a book probably of 365 devotions for a young family, things like this. There are ways that you and I in our family can sow seeds of truth and righteousness. Let's pray. ask you to bow your head and close your eyes. You know, most people here, uh, truly, you, you've come to faith in Christ. That's why you came to church today. You want to grow in the Lord and, and learn about the Lord and, and know how to follow Christ closer. But maybe you're here this morning and you've never given your life to Christ. You've never said, Lord Jesus, I'm a sinner Lord, I repent, I turn from selfish and sinful ways and I place my life in your hands. And I ask you, Jesus, to save me and change me and make me yours forever. As best as I know how, I give my life to you. You don't have to pray some fancy, long religious prayer. But in your heart of hearts, want Jesus Christ to be the Lord of your life. And hopefully and prayerfully this morning as as a father, as a mother, as a family. Maybe you heard something that kind of piqued your interest. Something that God would, would set your family on a, on a course of gathering around His Word consistently, sharing the truth, experiencing the Word of God and prayer together. But maybe you need to make that commitment, not just, okay, Lord, we're going to start tomorrow morning at 5 o'clock, nothing like that, but just, just, Lord, show us how. Show our family how to connect in this way. I'm going to pray and then I'll ask you to stand and and as you stand uh, if this altar is open come as a man, a woman, boy or girl teenager, single Father I thank you for your word I thank you for this very clear example out of the book of Acts I thank you, God, that you have set us in families, that you love our families. God, show us how to apply this to our life, to our marriage, to our family, that the generations, Lord, will be changed, be brought to Christ. And no matter how dark and broken this world becomes, 
we will shine like stars in the universe for your glory. Lord, your kingdom come. Lord, your will be done in our lives, in this church, in our families, in Jesus' name. I'm going to ask you to stand with me and uh, our praise team is going to play. Worship the Lord. Do what He wants you to do in your heart. Sorrows and trade. 